Amen. Thank you, Brother Eric. Thank you, Brother Jake, for reading. A uh, very famous passage in the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. There are several verses in there that I imagine many of you know and perhaps have been a help to you throughout your Christian life and your Christian growth. I think of verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And brethren, I know that this past month we've already heard some excellent instruction on the topic of Halloween as it approaches in just a couple of days. But if you would, bear with me for a few more minutes. I would like to preach a sermon that I've entitled, How to Abandon Hell's Holiday. How to Abandon Hell's Holiday. I want this sermon to be very, very practical. I know many of you are very aware of what Halloween is and what it's about. Perhaps there are new Christians here among us, and you're on a departure. As you grow in the Lord, you're beginning to see light and darkness much more clearly than you ever have in your life because of the Holy Spirit inside of you and because of your study of the Bible. I hope that's the case. So if you're a new believer or if you're someone here that is considering believing on Jesus Christ to be saved from your sin, please hear out the scriptures on this topic of hell's holiday. I'm going to stop and just pray and ask the Lord to help me as I preach this morning. Bow with me if you will and let's pray one more time. Lord Jesus, I do thank you for your scriptures and I just ask that the scriptures we look at this morning will give us a better understanding of how you view the wickedness of mankind sometimes, how you see this world. Please give us help as we speak with neighbors and friends. I just ask that you would honor your word, that you would give us the wisdom that we need. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. How to abandon hell's holiday. Think about this with me. Any of you here who have done any considerable amount of driving, and I would imagine that's the majority of those of us in here, if you don't have a license and you never bothered with that, and you think I'm joking, but I have a good friend who his wife never bothered to get her license until later on in life. She just really never had a need. Anyways, very intelligent lady, but um, dad and husband always drove around and she was content with that. But most of you here drive, right? And if you've done any interstate driving, there's several things you may notice about interstate driving. I want to pick on one for a moment. Think about this with me. Every so often, if you log in some time, I mean like several hours on the road, I'm an HVAC tech, so often our repairs take me from Jacksonville up into Georgia, or the Jake's country, the Strickland's country, and then over towards the Panhandle, or heaven forbid, down in the central part of the state in Orlando. I don't care to go down there, honestly. But we'll go down there or towards um, Palm Bay, Palm Coast. Um, you know, if you're a Floridian, you can imagine all the different towns in, in our state. It's a big state and several of the South Georgia towns. You'll get cooking on that interstate for a while. Just, you know, the dotted lines are droning on. And every so often you'll see a car on the side of the road, right? Now let me describe this car to you. All the tires don't necessarily match or there might even be a tire wheel missing, right? There might be some duct tape over the windows. You might see where they put some of that red tape over the brake lights so they could comply with the OT regulations, right? Let's just say it's not a beautiful car, right? And that car has been what? It's been abandoned. And there's a key indicator often when you can tell the owner is probably not going to come back and the state, FDOT or GDOT, the Department of Transportation, is going to come and record that car and they're going to impound it. It's probably going to sit there and rot until they auction it off. Often that cars like that will have like an orange sticker. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever seen that? At least up in Georgia as a young man, there was always an orange sticker. I can't remember the color down here. But it's been tagged and what that means is it's been abandoned. And if you think about it, most likely it's been abandoned because the actual owner realizes the money involved in wrecking it and repairing it is not even worth going back for the vehicle. Maybe you had those thoughts as you did some interstate driving. You know, that's kind of a picture of abandonment. That owner's never going to come back for that car. He's probably already driving another car. He'll never see it again. Does it need it? Does it miss it? Is not going to spend his money 
on repairing or recovering that car. Some, thing, some things in our life need to be abandoned as Christians. And brethren, I want you to know the practice and the celebration of Halloween needs to be abandoned by saints today. Especially here in America, we have fomented and created the holiday and promoted it worldwide. And would to God, God's people would say, enough is enough. We're done with that. We're going to abandon that because that is of the enemy. It is not of God. And I want to give you some Bible principles why you can come to that conclusion this morning. I know Pastor mentioned several things were a big help on what Halloween is about, how many aspects of it got to where it is today. He gave some good examples, did some great teaching on doctrine as he, cover, as, as he has covered the cults. But this morning, even Brother Ross mentioned in his Bible teaching the doctrine that we all hold dear as God's people, and that's a very beloved doctrine and a very needful doctrine, and that's the doctrine, the teaching of separation. There is a blessing to separating from the world and becoming more and more unified with the Lord and His Word. So you're there in 2 Corinthians 6. Look with me at the end of the chapter. I want to read several more verses. The Bible says this, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I reference again teaching that Brother Ross did this morning about separating from worldliness. Right here in Corinthians, we have a call for it again at the end of chapter 6, where Paul, talking to these Christians, Christian Corinthians, he said, if you remember, the Corinthians as a church went through some, some hard times. They went through some serious correction. But here you see the Apostle Paul encouraging them. He's now building them up in the faith and he's teaching them how to go forward. And what he says is he says, come out from among them. From who? From the unbelieving. From those that desire to remain in wickedness. He says, and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. Achan was mentioned this morning in the Sunday school hour. A very vivid illustration of how God wants us to not be a part of or touch that which is clearly of the devil and out of hell. And we can do that. We can do this. We can abandon hell's holiday with God's help. Let me give you four things this morning, four things that you could do to make sure that God's pleased with how you view the holidays, to help you stay away and be separate, not just from that, from hell and from Halloween and from the wickedness involved in it, but separated unto God to serve Him and to have His blessing on your life. That's one of the reasons why we have a chili cook-off. We want to give you an alternative to serve the Lord in place of what the devil has planned on October 31st. My mom's birthday is November 1st, and I always cherish that because we got to party with my mom right after we didn't party with the world the day before. And I just always saw that as a blessing. And as we look at um, Halloween, we want to get God's perspective on it. How many major holidays in our nation? Think with me if you will. I'm going to rattle off several that I think are the majors. If I miss one, y'all help me out. We got New Year's, Easter. I'm talking about culturally as Americans. We typically celebrate New Year's, Easter, July 4th or Independence Day. October 31st as a nation, many celebrate Halloween. Thanksgiving, and then Christmas. I think I got the majors there. Like if you were to open up a, a calendar like many of you carry or look at the calendar on your phone, often those dates are automatically just plugged in, right? You see them right there on the calendar as you look at your schedule. The fourth one I mentioned was the celebration of Halloween. Is this acceptable for a Christian, for a saint? A resounding no from the scriptures, as we'll see here. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, we read it. God commanded us to be separate. But I have a question. How do we do that, right? And I know I'm preaching this morning to a lot of seasoned Christians. I know you might be thinking, well, Chad, I understand. You know, I, I haven't participated in Halloween for X number of years. Hey, praise the Lord for that. But as that comes upon us every year, and we get hit with it, you know, and you go out retail shopping, and many of us have children we're trying to raise up. Many of you have grandchildren you seek to influence and build up as their grandparent. This comes every year. And have you noticed, as the Bible says, hell hath enlarged itself, right? Have you noticed this holiday is just growing and growing to the point 
It's the sizable celebration level as far as money and time and energy, maybe even greater than the other holidays that we as a people, as Americans, have celebrated for decades. It's out of control. Our culture, our nation is beginning, beginning to relish hell and all of its deeds. And it's affecting us. Would to God that believers won't have any part in it. Would to God that we could obtain the blessings that God has for us by avoiding it. So those are the six holidays. And I'm telling you, according to the Scripture, let's reject Halloween. And you know, if we can't get this one right as far as the way the Scriptures command separation, do you think we'll be able to detect worldliness that creeps in to an altruistic holiday, to a holiday that is much more benign and worthy? I love Thanksgiving. How many here like Thanksgiving? Okay, so I, I picked a good one. I love Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for me growing up since I was a little guy, like many of these kiddos here today, it was always around saved family members. We had a few unbelieving family members, but they still came and enjoyed fellowship. We loved having them reunite after maybe a whole year of not seeing them or communicating with them. So it was a big family gathering. My grandmother was a phenomenal cook. I mean, I, right now I'm thinking of flavors that I don't know if they'll ever return, right? Well, so Thanksgiving was an excellent time for me, and it was almost a week celebration for the Hearns and some of the Morgans. And I cherish it because we talked about the good things that God had done for us. Doesn't the Scriptures command us to give thanks in all things? We would. We would sit around and talk about the things God had done that year. We would talk about all the provisions He gave us. Sometimes we would talk about some of the tragedies, the difficulties. I think of the pilgrims. They went through hard, hard times. Many of them died in the process. Yet they still took some time and set it apart to thank God for His goodness to them and for His provisions. Thanksgiving has a very good root in our culture. Would to God we'd promote that and we would get rid of Halloween. Would to God as a culture we would see the difference between the two, is my point. Come out from among them and be ye separate. It couldn't be clear. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Actually, turn there with me if you will. Would you go to Ephesians 6? It's a famous passage. I know you know it. It talks about Christian warfare, right? Many of you have indeed memorized this. I know some of the Morgan kids, I believe, have memorized it. Ephesians chapter 6, or at least verses from it. While you're getting to Ephesians 6, I'm going to begin reading in verse 10. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole arm of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Continue on with me just a little bit. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand, and then he commands them, stand therefore. So Paul couldn't be more clear. Some of the men and I were talking about this. The Apostle Paul gives a lot of illustrations to physical combat. Have you ever noticed that? He says, I'm not one that fights as if I'm beating the air, like a boxer, right? He talks about wrestling here. I think of Greco-Roman wrestling, true wrestling, not the fake stuff that our culture has created, but real wrestling that is very physically intense. And then he talked about running races. And Paul used those as illustrations to help us understand that our battle is not like those physical battles or contentions, that our battle is spiritual. It's the unseen. And so when we think about Halloween, brethren, we have to remember all the paraphernalia that we see out there, the yard art and the stuff that's pumped into our retailers. Good grief, I'm, I'm, I work on trailers, on trucks. And I wish I could pack all that stuff up before it comes off the truck and send it back to hell where it came from. You can't even take children into certain places because of what it does. It's wrong. It's wicked. We ought to hate it. And that's my first point this morning. As we're looking there at Ephesians 6, it's actually my second point. I jumped ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm going to start there because I think it's appropriate. How to abandon hell's holiday? We can forsake Halloween as a practice. Would you, can we all agree on that? Does that make sense? 
If Halloween celebrates death and hell and gore and fear, this is really important because we can kind of separate those we love from the gore and the things that we don't want to see with our eyes. Just like it was preached this morning, being careful what goes in our eyes. We can separate from that a lot. But what about the promotion of fear among the parties and the hypocrisy? In fact, consider this with me, if you will. Let me do very quickly a comparison contrast. So like, tune, you know, tune in. You add to the list as I'm giving these, okay? Think about this. The comparison of hell and heaven of a holiday like Thanksgiving where we give thanks to God for His goodness and who He is and what He's done for us versus hell where we're focusing on Halloween where we're focusing on hell, Satan and the enemy, death and violence. Think about this. Halloween celebrates blood as it applies to death. We celebrate the blood of Christ who cleanses us from sin. Amen. Halloween would celebrate fear. It would promote fear. It wants to scare people. It wants people to live in fear. They think that's fun somehow. The Scriptures teaches us faith. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Halloween is not sound. Halloween promotes animals and beasts ruling over mankind in their wickedness. Or the blending of the two, which is vile. God says in Genesis, I think of Genesis 1 particularly, there are other instances where God told man to have dominion. Man rules animals and beasts. God has put a fear in animals naturally to fear man. That's of God. We all know those stories where folks had a really rough encounter with a wild beast, and that can happen, and we don't downplay that. But overall, God has created us with the intelligence, and He has given us the command to dominate the world that He has created and put us in. That was our charge. That's what heaven or what Christianity celebrates. Halloween promotes darkness. John 3.19 tells us what? That their deeds were evil, right? They didn't want to come to the light. Whereas Christianity, we are called the children of light, like in Ephesians 5. Complete opposites. Halloween would promote lies and tricks. In Christianity, in a holy day, we would produce truth and service to others. To love your neighbor as yourself. To serve your neighbor. To preach the gospel to your neighbor. And take them to eternity with you if they would just believe on Jesus. Halloween promotes costumes, which I interpret as hypocrisy. Where is a holy day or a worthy day, a Christian celebration would be transparency. Here's what I mean. I don't want my children to dress up and pretend like wicked individuals. I want them to look in Hebrews 11 and think of the, the men and women of faith that have gone on before us. That cloud of witnesses that the Bible teaches us in Hebrews 11. That we would emulate them, that we would think about their challenges and how God brought them through. And we would say, man, I love what I see in the man David. I love what I see in the man Daniel. Look at what God did through him. Look at his character. Look at how he stood. Talk about an illustration of Daniel in the lion's you know it, kiddos, right? Den. Thrown to the lions. Yet God stopped their mouth. He shut them. Because Daniel was a man of God. Amen. These are the differences between Halloween and a true holy day, something that Christians can celebrate. And finally, for Halloween, this comparison contrast. Halloween, for most of the world, is simply a day and a night to excuse all their sin. Hey, set your conscience down. What you normally wouldn't do, it's okay, you can fudge a little, just go ahead. And as God's people, we would say, no, reject that. We have all the more reason to obey God that we might have His blessing. Christian friends, there's just no comparison. If I went around the room, I'm confident we could compile a list that was five or six times bigger than what I've just shared with you if we did a comparison contrast. And we would be able at the end of that time period to say, you know what? Truly it is hell's holiday. Let us abandon it. And let us move on to the things that God has for us. How do we abandon hell's holiday? I gave you one reason. I said we can forsake the practice. We read 2 Corinthians 6.17. Here's a couple of ways you can do that. These are temptations I've faced or that I've encountered. Maybe you could fill in the blank or you can resonate with this. Um, office parties, neighborhood gatherings,
community gatherings, there's going to be a lot of people and groups that are going to promote Halloween. They're going to offer you their time. They're going to say, hey, it's going to seem benign. They're going to encourage you. No, we don't, you know, we don't do all the gore and the violence, but you know, we got the candy and we got the games. We got Listen, there is no reason for a saint to participate in a day set apart for the celebration of the wicked. God said, come on out and be separate. Stand with me. Stand with my words that I might bless you. So I encourage you, as those temptations come up, whether it be at work, you can, you can politely decline. You don't have to stand there and preach. Sometimes you may have an opportunity. But could you not excuse yourself? Let me give you one quick anecdote. As an HVAC technician in California, I have an instance that I can clearly remember. And I'm not patting myself on the shoulder. It was a little bit difficult because I believe I was the only guy that did not go. My whole team, which are very skilled men, we had a very good leader. He's very good at his trade. And every year he did a huge Halloween party. And he was, he was a skilled man, but he was a wicked man. And on that day, he was known for getting all the texts together. And they just lived it up. I mean, shameful things. Because guys would kind of murmur about it. And it's a week out. And I've already been asked several times, hey, you going to be there? And many of these men know what I believed. Because I'd preached the gospel to several of them. We had even seen one or two texts saved in that group, in that company. And man, the pressure there to just, because here's how it's presented. Well, listen, you don't have to stay long. Just come by. Get some food, you know. Head on. No. No, separate. Stay away. Keep your blessing. Stay with God's power. Listen to your conscience. Let the Holy Spirit guide you away from the activities of the wicked. The worldliness, as we were taught this morning, that wants to creep into our life. As we were reminded Wednesday, why? Because we all battle this flesh. And the old man, like Romans 7 says, that is ever present with us until we're glorified. So let us have victory in that area. Brethren, forsake Halloween in your practice. Here's another way to abandon hell's holiday. You should hate Halloween in your heart. You say, you know, Chad, I don't know. Hate's a strong word. I agree with you. Hate is an intense word. In fact, I think hate sometimes gets abused as a word. Hate can be used by Christians even in a sinful way. In fact, let me just go ahead and get that out there. By definition, I want you to know, in the Bible, as you read the word hate, there may be other nuances, but there's two big things that show up when you read in the Psalms or you read in the Old Testament prophets when they use the word hate, or even in New Testament use of the word. You'll see that often hate means to love less. That means it's not describing that, you know, that anger, that emotion of, or that drives you to do something sinful against another. But hate sometimes can be used in the Bible to mean you love less. Like we think of that classic um, text where God talks about how Jacob he loved, right? But Esau have I hated. So we can see there how it means to love less. But clearly there are times in the scripture often where hate means to abhor. In fact, we're commanded to do so. So we are known as children of light. We are known as people of love because God is love, right? First John teaches us that. But there are things that God commands us to hate. And brethren, I just throw that out to you. I'm still learning how to do that well. We should hate sin in our lives. Amen? We should hate sin among a congregation. We should hate the deeds of the wicked. And I'm speaking of Halloween. In fact, um, if you will, go to Psalm 15. Would you turn back to the Old Testament to Psalm 15? While you're headed there, I'm going to read Psalm 101, verse 3. So you go to Psalm 15. I'm going to read out loud Psalm 101, 3. It says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. And notice King David here. He was very specific in how he used that word hate. He said, I hate the work of them that turn aside. He didn't command or emulate there for us to hate people as individuals because they did this to me or they said that. But he said, listen, if it's the work of the wicked, we need to hate those deeds. We need to point that out and say, that is wrong. God hates it. I want to hate it too. I don't want to be a part of it. And as our culture progresses in its hatred towards God, we're going to have to continue to up our skills in identifying cultural participation or celebrations that we need to put our finger on and say, we've got to reject that. 
That's just not of God anymore. Halloween's already well beyond that. In fact, it began that way. So how to abandon hell's holiday? Number one, forsake Halloween in your practice. The second thought this morning is hate Halloween in your heart. I read Psalm 101.3 to you. You're there in Psalm 15, correct? The Bible says this. It's a short psalm, so I'd like to read it out loud. It's very clear. It's a great help. So read there with me silently as I read aloud. The Bible says, King David speaking, he said, Lord, who shall abide in my tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Look with me again in verse 4. Verse 4. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned. Now, contemned is not one of those words that we throw around every week, right? Oh, <laughs> that's contemned to me. You know, it's, a, it's just not a common word, but it's a great word. It means to despise. It's very similar to the word hate as the word hate is used biblically. There are certain things to us as God's people because of God and who He is that should be contemned. We should hate Him. We should abhor Him. Amen? And if we'll do that, as we see in Psalm 15, there is great reward and blessing for following the Lord's lead on discerning between right and wrong. Notice that David used the word vile person. So don't misunderstand me this morning, church family. I'm not saying everyone that participates in Halloween. In fact, I would say the vast majority are going along with the celebration very ignorantly. It's presented as something simple. It's presented as, hey, we've always done this as a country. It's every year. It's no big deal. Just some candy, a couple hours of fun, some costumes. We're going to get together, eat some dinner, and then go home. And for many people, that is all that happens. But for countless others, it is not. And that's why I bring up the word vile there in Psalm 15. If you think about the word vile, apply that word to all the promoters of Halloween. The CEOs that market the, the retail items, those who organize the celebrations, the festivities, the activities. Think about the men and women whose mind is behind the organization of this holiday in our nation. It'll give you a shiver. Friends, that's out of hell as we know. And we need to remember that David said, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. He's saying, hey, the person that desires to dwell with the Lord, to think God's thoughts after him, he talked about God's holy hill. David often talked about being in the Lord's house, did he not? And he referenced being around God's people. And we know that David surrounded himself with God's people. In fact, we know that David was a leader of God's people he loved the Lord. He was called what? A man after God's own heart. Here's his thought. Hey, I want to be around God. I want to be like God. I want to be around the people of God. I want to be in God's house. That's going to require me to view a vile person as contempt. Now notice I didn't argue for going out and saying all type of vile things back to them or directing your hatreds toward an individual. But we need to remember who's behind Hell's Holiday. And just like we heard this morning in Sunday school, I know I keep referencing that, but I couldn't believe how many things fit together between these thoughts and how this is planned. They have a desire to hook more and more Americans until that holiday is the holiday of the United States of America. Whereas I was clear in my mind as a young kid growing up in the 80s and 90s that Thanksgiving was the biggest holiday of our nation perhaps. Really, that's the way I thought. I'm not saying I'm accurate. I'm just saying the history I was taught about how folks came from Europe, from the old world, over here, most of them, maybe not all, there were those who were here for the wrong reasons, but many of them had those motivations of being out from underneath a tyrannical crown. Why? For the major reason of being able to worship God according, you can finish the statement, right, to the dictates 
of their own consciences. We want to follow this book. We want to please God. We need to be out from underneath this oppression so that we can do that. They didn't want to be told how to worship God. They wanted to worship God according to the Bible. And so they came over in faith, risked money, lost loved ones, tragedy, heartache, rough winters. We know the stories. There's many, many accounts. If you want to get started on that, just pick up a book, an autobiography, or some of the biographical writings of Miles Standish or William Bradford. And you'll find out what these people are made of. And for many years, our country had Thanksgiving as a major holiday because we knew who our God was. But now we, we pump our money into hell's holiday. And God help us as his people to take a stand and to abandon it. So we should hate it in our heart. I think that's appropriate. Here's a third thought this morning. Thanks for sticking with me. How to abandon hell's holiday? Well, thirdly, God wants you to expose Halloween to loved ones or acquaintances. This is where it gets tough. Now, I understand you all have busy schedule. If you're like me, you're doing good to get enough rest during the week, right? <laughs> so I look around, you got all these tired parents in here, you know. But hey, we got the hefty smiling kids. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it to invest your life in the next generation. That's why I'm preaching against Halloween this morning. I'll just be straightforward with you. I want to preach it so clearly, and I want to stand with other good men and women who understand these doctrines, who want their children to have a life of God's blessing so that when they die and they head on to glory one day, they'll be able to face the Lord, not with a whole bunch of regrets, but with a lot of reward, knowing that they had given their life to serve Him. So it's worth it. It's worth it to preach against certain things. Expose Halloween to a loved one or acquaintance. Maybe you could pick two people who you know are naive about it. So let's say they might even be a Christian or they're open to believing the Bible, but yet participating in Halloween's just always been a part of their life. You could sit down with them and ask them some questions. Yes, I know I could. I'm thinking of one person right now. I'm really curious how they see it. And if I'm a good friend, I'll probably look for an opportunity to say, hey, you know it's hell's holiday, don't you? It's not a joke. Proverbs tells us 14, verse 9, I think, that it's fools who make a mock at sin. I don't want to be a fool. I've been a fool enough in my life. I don't want to continue that trend. How about you? Halloween's not a joke and hell's not a joke. We've heard some good preaching on that. It's just not a joke. So why would you invest your time and your energy? I'm just talking out loud to you, brethren. You folks are skilled. You could lead someone else away from poor thinking about hell's holiday and help bring them out of such thinking and help them see how it's a ploy of the enemy to damage people's lives and to destroy people, especially children. I think one time I was allowed to go and collect some candy. I'm not bragging about that. I'm not trying to put anybody in a bad light. Um, we weren't involved in any mischief. Mischief. I was with my cousins, who I know well. Both of those men are saved. And we collected some candy one year as a little boy. But I can't imagine sending children out on their own today. I didn't have one person bother me. But can you imagine here 30-something years later, 40 years later, sending a young child out on a day when there's adults who have plans to hurt, to molest, and to destroy people's life. Would to God we had a nation of men who stood up and said, we just need to take this off the schedule. Or some men who said, you know what? I'm going to see if I can get this off the schedule at my place of employment. Why do we participate in this? Hey, maybe it'd be worth it. Do you have a regular retail place that you shop where you know the manager per personally? I have one place like that where I know him, like I've had conversations with him. So when all that, all that junk comes in, they start... It'd be worth it to tell him and appeal to his conscience. Say, have you ever thought about the effects of all this on your customers, especially the children? We ought to appeal to the consciences and to the minds of good men. Even some of our founding fathers, I think one of them commented, he says, what happens when good men do nothing? Right? I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Good men need to do something. It starts with their homes, then our church, and then I'm encouraging you as a third thought, how to abandon hell's holiday you could perhaps teach a person or two over the next day or so before it comes about Hell's Holiday and expose it to them, show them for what it is, and help them understand.
Could I give you a fourth one this morning? My time is gone. How to abandon hell's holiday? Teach the next generation not just the what of Halloween, but the why. I think sometimes children need to know the whys. You know, they start out learning just the what, right? I remember my dad was pretty good at that. He didn't want to be questioned. If there was something that needed to be done, my dad's a quiet guy, but when he spoke, he meant what he said. And I've come to respect him and appreciate and love him for that. But it wasn't time for all these explanations. It was obey dad, and then often I had an opportunity to learn from him later on once I had obeyed. And he would teach me, well, you know, son, this was going on. I needed you to take care of that. I need to take care of this. I just needed an obedient son. We had to get all this done. And then as I got older and older, I started to understand the why. It wasn't just the what. Obey dad. That's what God commanded. Ephesians 6, we were there earlier. The beginning of that chapter is that great commandment to children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Obey and honor. So your what will get answered. And then all of a sudden children begin asking why. And that's where as mothers and fathers, we're able to explain to them light and darkness. We explain to them how... If we choose sin, we can destroy our life. But if we will reject sin and ask God for help, we can have great blessing. We can preserve life. You can have joy. You can have success. God will bless you in it. So my, first, my fourth thought was to teach the next generation not just the what of Halloween, but the why. Would you turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 6 with me? I'd like to take you to one more passage this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Many of you know this passage. Deuteronomy chapter 6. While you're getting there, I'm going to read from Psalms. The first Psalm. Psalm 1 says this. You're headed to Deuteronomy 6. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. There's an illustration in the middle of Psalm 1 that I think many of us relate with. How many of this year have put out some fruit trees? Like this year in the past few years? Anybody here? Okay, quite a few. I thought it might only be a couple of folks, but I know we have. And we're really excited about that because we're learning about more husbandry and um, what's it called when you keep an orchard? I think there's a technical word. Y'all can straighten me out after the sermon, all right? But um, horticulture, is that it? Yeah, where you, where you foster and grow fruit-bearing trees and plants. So it's not just the garden and the ground, but you've got stuff growing on trees out of the ground, and you keep animals as where, well, there's a whole blending there. We see that from in, in Genesis, how God designed this world to operate that way. Lo and behold, that was the way it was done for a long time before grocery stores, right? So you've put some fruit trees out, right? So in Psalm 1, the illustration is there that a man that rejects the ungodly and his practices, in this case, I'm advocating for rejecting Halloween outright, says you're going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and you're going to bring forth fruit. Now, on our property, the previous owner was an asphalt guy, and he paved the driveway in asphalt. And then there's some asphalt that leads up to the barn, or at least what's left of that driveway. But I noticed as we've worked on the yard that there's patches of asphalt in other areas in the yard where there's grass right now. So the grass looks like a blanket. It's covering that area. But we'll be digging and we'll hit chunks of asphalt. So I get a sense that as a tradesman, maybe he was in a hurry, maybe he had a lot of work. He laid that drive but he wasn't real good at maybe cleaning up or he had some areas where he dumped some leftover asphalt. You know how it goes in hot, right? You sp spread it out and you compact it, okay? You press it out, I guess I should say, and then it cools in place. Maybe there were some leftover piles and he didn't quite get that all up off the ground. Years later, the grass grows over it and we come along with a shovel, clink, there's grass there. But would you plant a tree there? 
In fact, I've cut two dead oak trees, large trees, out of my yard, and I realize now why they're dead. Those trees took some abuse when that asphalt went in and they didn't make it. So we're busy finding these places and removing that, right? Why? Because when we plant these trees on our property, we want them to thrive for years to come. We want to see them come to fruition. We want to see them bear fruit, right? That's what Psalm's telling us. For us as God's people, it's going to take work to make sure we're planted, right, in the Word of God. That we're tuned in to God's agenda. And I know for many of you that is the case. And thank God that you're here. And thank God that you're reading the Scriptures. And thank God that you're growing in your skills as a soul winner. Thank God that you want to teach your children truth. Keep it up. Continue it. Don't quit. And one of the ways you can really deal a blow is abandon hell's holiday. Just don't even acknowledge it. Let's cut it off as God's people. And we'll see more of God's blessing. We'll see, like a tree, ourselves come to fruition and bearing fruit. So we need to be planted in good ground, right? You're there in Deuteronomy 6. Read with me if you will. The Bible says, I'll begin reading in verse 5. Deuteronomy 6, 5. Thou, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and then when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land, which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells dig, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord." So God said, listen, I want you to do this. I want you to put up the memorials. I want you to teach what I did to your kids so that you don't forget me and what I've done for you. So what you have in Deuteronomy is the mirror image of what you read in Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is a negative. It says, hey, don't walk with them, right? Don't stand with them. Definitely don't sit with them. In fact, the opposite is true. In Deuteronomy, we have Israel being commanded, hey, teach your kids about this stuff. It's not just the what, it's the why. I did much for you. I am your God and I'm a jealous God and I want you and I want to bless you. So teach it to your children and reject it. Separation is important. How to abandon hell's holiday? We looked at four things this morning. We can hate Halloween in our heart. We can forsake Halloween as a practice. We can expose Halloween and what it is to a loved one or acquaintance. And we definitely need to teach, not just the what of an unholy day, but the why. Why we separate from it to our children, to the next generation. Brethren, I got one more thought and I'm done. Catch this, okay? So those are four thoughts, right? Hating Halloween in your heart, that's the understanding. It's what God commanded, and we, need, we, we search the Scriptures to come up with that conclusion, okay? Number two was forsake it as a practice. I know I inverted those earlier. That's the conviction. Do you see that? First of all, you have the understanding. Then there's a conviction that forms, hopefully, in our heart and in our life. And then the third one is expose it to a loved one or friend. There's compassion. It's not just what's in our heart, but now we want to spread that to someone else. We want someone else to have that understanding that they might make a conviction to separate. So that's compassion. And then the last thought was teaching it to the next generation. That's conversion. Now we're gaining ground. Now we're actually seeing the fruit, the blessings of God. And church family, I just want you to know, I'm done preaching this morning. I just want to be real candid and tell you, I, I love coming to church. Amen. I love being around you all. I love fellowshipping with you. I love talking about the Bible with you. I love going through the trials of life with you all. Life's not easy. It's, it's a bear. Let's not pick up the burden of Halloween. Let's drop it like a bad habit. I know most of you have. Let's convert others. Let's help them understand why a Christian has no business partic participating in such an event. God will bless us for it, and we'll see His hand in it, and we'll see the next generation have great boldness. And God will bless them as well. Let's pray together, shall we?
Lord Jesus, thank you for these passages in Corinthians and in Ephesians and the Old Testament and Psalm and Deuteronomy. Lord, help us to succeed as your people. We need your blessing. We look forward to things today, the activities, the lunch, and the preaching tonight, and the singing. We ask that the Holy Spirit would have his way in what we're doing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.